last Saturday class, you did the 18 rounds, correct? Mm -hmm. Can anybody tell me why the Buddha taught us the 18 rounds? The psychology of the human mind. And what does that mean? Well, that's what I remember and I summarize it myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. No, that's fair. Anybody else? What does it what is that what does the, the teaching of the eighteen drums have? Yes. Um, it, it seems like a much more elaborative teaching of the six senses. Okay. You want to expand upon that just a bit? Sure. Um, it, it tells us in more precise detail what um, what each sense uh, really means, both physically and mentally. Okay. Okay. So, can I put you in charge of this? Sure. Oh, thank you. I don't think our runner's here today. No, no, there is not today. So today's class is is on the five uh, skandhas, or the five aggregates. So the Buddha taught both these teachings. <coughs> the 18 realms at one time, and then the five skandhas at another time. And the reason for that is because there's different kinds of people. And he knew that certain of his, his followers would get the 18 realms. And the other ones, that the five scandals would be the five aggregates, would be <coughs> better effective. But the real reason why he taught us these very important teachings is to really get in touch with our senses, our own experience, our own condition, to understand ourselves a little bit more. Now, first of all, before I start, I really want to uh, say that this class is based on some teachings by Thich Nhat Hanh and uh, some teachings from this wonderful text of the great realizations from Venerable Master Xin Yun. And for the newer students who haven't been able to study this sutra, <coughs> well, it's just a wonderful Sutra and for the ongoing students. I think it's been at least three times, right? Mm -hmm. So I just want to say where I got my material from. So 18 realms, just to digress for a minute, because when I first saw that teaching, the word realms, and I've said this before in other classes, it gets confusing because we talk about the six realms of existence. Then they talk about the three realms. And then there was the 18 realms. And I thought, another 18 realms? Like on top of the six, there's more. Realms in this situation, because of the translation, means types. So types of data that's coming in. Stuff that we're taking in all the time. And really, Buddhism is very straightforward, because it, it's talking here with the 18 realms and the five skandhas about the human condition. And everything that the Buddha taught us <coughs> is verified by his or our own uh, observations of the way things are, the way our life is. And if we look at Buddhism very simply, forget about all the profundity, <laughs> we really see that Life is filled with frustration, and it's, <laughs> it's filled with pain. <coughs> and when we break <coughs> everything out, we understand that at the base of this, it's because we're trying to secure a relationship with our life with something that is self. <coughs> the Buddha taught us that nothing <coughs> stays the same. Everything changes. So we look and we try to grab to anything that we think will last. But the problem is nothing does. 
So it causes frustration. It causes pain in our life. We grasp, we cling, we get attached to things, we form emotional relationships, but none of this lasts. You save for years for a sports car. You want one, not me. I had my sports mm -hmm. car already, but for the, many gentlemen, you know, they talk about <laughs> in their 40s, they buy a sports car, ditch the wife or something. <laughs> 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 Get a sports car. And then somebody, or have you ever heard, I've met people that save for a brand new car. They always got secondhand cars, so they saved for a new car and drove it off the lot and got in an accident and told it. I mean, we laugh, but it's not. How painful is that? Oh my, that's, that's not fun at all. And, and so we find that there is this frustration. We find that there is this suffering. Now, Buddhism is seen and taught from two perspectives. in respect to itself, a separate thing. Gestalt said that a thing is nothing more than the totality of its parts in which it can be divided. But the thing is, we look at a dog and a house, and we grasp onto these things, again, because they're fiction. We think they're solid, but they're not. Everything is a collection of people. The other perspective with Buddhism is relationship to other things. First to yourself and then to other things. Like the dynamic events. Venerable Master in his core teaching talks about dynamic events. Hello, sweetie. How are you? <laughs> in other words, nothing moves by itself mm -hmm. under its own power. All phenomena arise because it's conditioned by an infinity of other phenomena, an infinity of other things, and when, or conditions, an infinity of conditions. And when I read this a few years ago, all the <coughs> years, it never hit me. But when I looked at it, all the conditions in my life, I thought, wow, all of this contributed. And I was, I was gobsmacked. I just sat there and thought about it. I was coming out of meditation. I thought of all the conditions that had played out in my life. It was a moment. I had to get real with it. And it, it was um, really eye-awakening. And when we look at science today, like Gestalt's theory was the first perspective. We look at modern physics the quantum, quantum physics today. And they talk about, it's taken all these years, the Buddha taught these teachings 2,600 years ago. And it's taken all these years for modern science to finally get up and say, well, there's the wave light theory. Particle and wave theory. There's a particle within a wave, and a wave isn't a particle. But we know this from Buddhism through dependent everything is interconnected. So you're probably thinking, this is the five standards again. Well, no. So what, what, then with Venerable Man, he and I sat down and she asked me how I was going to do this class, and I kind of told her, and she went, yeah. No, I get that. But I really want to draw you into some of the other teachings that you have. I just don't want to stand up and talk about the five standards. I've done that before. That did <laughs> but I just want to draw some things in to some of our other teachings. Now, your handouts, everybody get their hand out? I'll, 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 well, Google me, I'll send them to you. Okay, so you have this, this, this material. So, your handout says that the skandhas are heaps or baskets or collections of all these things that constitute, as I said before, our human experience, our human condition. So the Buddha taught us that we have three basic kinds of energy. Mindfulness, 
concentration and insight. Mindfulness and concentration are the seven innate factors of the noble eagle chakra. And insight comes to wisdom when we apply the teachings, the knowledge, to our experience of the daily human experience. And we'll glean some insight, hopefully some wisdom, but insight along the way. These energies are generated through meditation, and you've done your meditation today. But they can be produced anytime. You can do it mindful when you brush your teeth. You can concentrate walking the dogs. I looked at <laughs> walking the dogs. Or you can gain insight all the time, doing everything. And this is the problem, that she's not sitting upstairs on a Saturday in the meditation room. It's available all the time. And mindfulness, concentration, and insight are always mindfulness, insight, and concentration on something. There has to be an object to our mindfulness, concentration, and insight. Probably still saying, when is she going to get to the bar soon? Yeah. <laughs> Mindfulness, concentration, and insight can lead to the four objects of, my, of mindfulness. And we discuss the four foundations, or I discuss the four foundations of mindfulness when I did the class on the seven basic factors of the noble path. This wonderful non rounding. It's supposed to be a tangerine. <laughs> and this particular tangerine has four segments, each representing one of the four foundations or objects of mindfulness. Objects of mindfulness, objects of, of concentration, an object that can bring insight. The first one I'm going to give you is a, a B. A B is for body. Now you guys know the, the B twin thing I venerable man Yi has been introducing the four foundations of mindfulness. Very simple. She'll have them she'll have them connect with their breath. Breath. Yeah. And that's why the Buddha taught about the body to connect with the breath. Breathe in peacefully, breathe out mindfully, see through all we said. But when I did the class on right mindfulness, I introduced to the class 16 points that the Buddha taught with the Annie Patty Sanders Sutra. If anybody wants these 16 points, just email Venerable Mandy and I will send them to, to her so you can get them. They're very easy, but they help us connect with our breath to our body. And the f each, each of the four are divided into four for a total of 16. So the first object being the body. Breathing in long, I know that I'm breathing in long. Breathing out long, I know I'm breathing out long. And it goes on like this, short. Uh, the, next, the next one is to be aware that you're breathing, to know that you're in your body. And finally, calm your body. So we connect with the breath, with the body. The second one, does anybody know what the second slice of tangerine is from the foundations of mindfulness? Anybody? Great, yeah. Feelings. <coughs> so feelings here. <laughs> feelings, when we connect with our feelings. <laughs> when we, it's a duck. <laughs> uh, a sound effect. So when we really are there mindful and we connect with our feelings like we connect with our breath. Huh. 
I mean, look at the nature of the feeling. You get down deep. Where is that coming from? Why am I feeling this way? The next one. Foundation of mindfulness. What is it? Brian, do you know this one? The mind. Thank you. It is the mind. Some of you are already thinking ahead, saying, now I know what she's doing. So in the mind, the Buddha taught us that there, I'm going to make this bigger, 51 mental formations. 51 mental formations. And like a river that's made of water, think of these mental formations in your mind. You probably experience when you try to meditate. <laughs> You try to clear your mind, and one of the mental formations are going to come up. But if you think of the mental formations are like drops of water in a river, they're always flowing, always flowing. But the mental formations can be positive, they can be joy, they can be loving kindness, they can be compassion. There can be negative mental formations like anger, <coughs> frustration, desperation. They're all there. Or there can just be neutral mental formations. Just thinking. I'm just thinking. Neither negative or positive. But the big thing here, and especially when you're trying to meditate, you be aware of them. Like feelings, being aware of your mental form. Ah. So if a mental formation in the form of anger arises, you go, I'm feeling angry. Why am I feeling angry? What is the nature and the root of where that anger is coming from? It's important to be mindful, to be aware. <coughs> now mental formations are subjects and objects. Subjects and objects of the mental formation. Okay. And this is our mind. Okay. Subjects of our mental formations you covered in last Saturday's class. The eight conscious. consciousness are your subjects. You're probably saying, but Jan, <laughs> Jan, we only covered six. Well, I'm sure you guys know what the eight is. The Alaya consciousness, the, the karmic seeds are there. I'm sure we've covered that. But the seven, very seldom do we ever talk about the seven. They're the man. That's what we're going to get into a little bit later on about self and non-self. Because all the others kind of fuel the manners. Why are we afraid about this permanent self? Over here, the objects. Anybody have any idea what the objects of our mind are? The 51 mental formations. Subjects and objects. And you're probably thinking, well, what does this really matter? But it matters because the subject and the object in our mind arise at the same time. When you get angry, you get angry at something or someone. You just don't get angry. Many of you walk around angry at yourself, but then I really feel badly for you. Now, when I should go back to the six, the six consciousness, you realize that come from the sense, the senses, right? Your eyes. The object of your sight and the, the, the eye consciousness, just the quick. So those were the four, the, the first six come from. So the objects of your mind, this is why I've given this to you, is the last segment. 
objects of your mind is the last of your foundations of mindfulness. These are mental states. These are the five hindrances, folks. What's the five? What's one of the five hindrances? Greg. What's the first one? Sensual desire. Sensual desire. Hello, 18 rooms. <laughs> kind of see a little connection there. The first is sensual desire. Anybody else? Yes. Restlessness and remorse. Uh, sloth and tupar. Uh, doubt and ill will. Ill will is like anger. I mean, you're really ticked at someone and you wish them ill will in a very profound way or not so profound. Now, the thing is, we can't take the subject out of the object. The Buddha taught us that. That they manifest almost at the same time. If we think of perception, the objects of perception just arise almost at the same time, but in milliseconds. And I was thinking of an example, <laughs> and I use this all the time, so bear with me. At least I'm consistent, if nothing else. The chocolate cake. I used this with desire when I did the second realization. My granddaughter, when she was one year old, my daughter baked chocolate cupcakes. And I walked into the house, and of course, I knew right away. I said, I could smell them. I knew what was coming from them. But of course, she was playing narrowly around. She was only one. She didn't have that connection. Her mother presents her the cupcake. Once the candle's gone, there's the cupcake. Well, my, daughter, my granddaughter's looking at this. She reaches in and has a little sniff. OK, all this is imprinting into the mind, eh? The smell. Then, the fork comes and the cake's spongy. The icing on the finger. Well, haven't we just got everything imprinted? Now she knows what a cupcake is. And that's how it goes. At one year of age, all those senses have come <coughs> together for her to have this now perception of a chocolate cupcake. Okay. But if we think of, and, I, and this is just digressing for a moment, because when I was preparing this, I was thinking of different cultures. Now, if we gave Grace or Venerable Nani or Sheila a chocolate cake, a piece of wonderful decadent cake, they might not necessarily enjoy it because, no, because they, they would say, too sweet, too sweet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, too sweet. <laughs> it's a very stereotyping. <laughs> but let me, go, let me go a little step further. I went out for dinner at this wonderful restaurant and I saw gorgeous German chocolate cake. And I ordered a piece of that. And I was disappointed. Because the Germans, like the Chinese, don't use as much sugar. It was good, but it wasn't the same. So these, my misperceptions, right? my misperceptions. <coughs> and if it's just with a piece like chocolate cake, what is it with everything else? You know, how we judge. <coughs> oh dear. Life is not easy. So now we've talked about the four foundations of mindfulness. Finally, let's talk about five scanners. We have another tangerine here. Okay, so the five scanners really help us with our practice. Not to describe reality as it is, but it just helps us, again, get in contact with the human experience, the human condition. So we got the, there's five, five, one, two, three, all right, five, five in my tangerine. And the first one, and you have it in your handout, what's the first scan? Don't everybody yell out at one time. What is it? Four. Four. So I'll put an F for four. We got form and we got body. Okay, you starting to see why I'm coming now. You probably did. 
Okay, so we have form. What's form? What's it made of? Matter. Matter. <coughs> and matter is made of energy. What are the four great elements? Four great elements. So the form, the Buddha taught us, is composed of the four great elements. But your handout also says it's con it's composed of something else. Five, 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 five. Anybody got handouts? Somebody's got their handout. What's the five? The four great elements. The five. That's right. organs. Not the mind. Sense the, organs. The, sen the, the sense organs. Exactly. That goes to make our farm. So if you look at your handout, what does my handout say? Four great elements and the aggregates of form call, uh, correspond with the physical factors. Just wanted you to see that. that that's our form. Any questions about that? Well, the next one, what's the next one? It's all listed there. Feelings, okay, well, let's see. Here's form, and we've got feelings. Form and feelings. Now, you know from your handout, there can be positive, negative, or neutral feelings. But you can't have feelings with the others, without the others. You can't have feelings without the form. You can't have feelings without your sense. That's how that ties together. Now the next one that isn't there with the four foundations of mindfulness is P for perception. But I did mention that the subject and objects of our perception arise at the same time. Within milliseconds of each other. Another example is if I take the sheet of paper, the left and the right side of the sheet of paper arise at the same time. And even if I fold it smaller and smaller, there's always a left and a right side. That might be too simplistic, but it, it's there. You can't have one without the other. So the one that we haven't talked about Next one is mental formations, which we talked about in much greater detail under the mind with the four foundations of mindfulness. And the last one is consciousness. And you reviewed that in detail with the 18 rounds. You seem confused. I'm just trying to absorb it all. Oh, <laughs> I confused the poor guy. No, 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 not yet. Okay. That's a technique, please. <laughs> so the Buddha talked in. <laughs> the, the Buddha talked about consciousness, and this might help a little bit in terms of mind and store. Now I alluded to this before when I was talking about the foundations of. So he, he's divided this into mind and store. The store is the alaya consciousness, the eighth level of consciousness where all the karmic seeds are stored. So going along with our example of anger, if you're not mindful, if you're not aware of what's rising in you, seeds of anger can rise as mental formations, MF, into your mind. But if you're practicing your four foundations of mindfulness and you say, oh, gee whiz, I'm angry. I'm really feeling ticked. But you don't want to feel ticked. You don't want to create those conditions. You know enough about Buddhism and you're mindfully aware that you're feeling angry. And as we've already talked about, your objects of, of mindfulness, you're mad, you're mad at somebody, you're something. 
And just know that if you take that out, you're going to create some conditions. Yeah? And ultimately harm. So if you're feeling these seeds of anger arising, what did the Buddha say we can water? What kinds of seeds can we water to offset anger? Wholesome seeds. One particular. Patience. <coughs> Thank you. The wisdom of our little friend. I use that a lot. Okay. That's what I need a lot. Patience. Oh, that's my Why are the seeds of patience? So if this goes down and this comes up, but hey, what growth you've had. What insight you've had. Woo! You're using your mindfulness energy, your concentration, and now you have insight. There's another one. Patience for self and others. Compassion. Compassion for self and others. Water those seeds. The thing I love about Buddhism, he says, hey, you've got all these problems. But then he gives you the solutions. So many ways of life, they don't give you the solutions. You're kind of funneling out there by yourself. So you water those seeds. You're reducing them. Now. <laughs> Tying together something else. Both of the classes, uh, both beginners classes, had the 12 links. And everybody's going, oh no. What was the fourth of the 12 links? <laughs> Anybody? Everybody's scrambling, everybody's looking in their book. What was, what was the fourth? of the 12 links. Form and name. Form and name or mind and body. Both, both, are, both are truly acceptable. You can have body <coughs> and mind. This is just a, a tangerine with two pieces left. <laughs> We've eaten all the rest. Okay, so where is she going with this? Body refers to the the form slice of the five skandhas. The mind. Which of the skandhas refer to the mind? The other four. The other four, absolutely. All the rest go into the mind. This is getting really into the human experience. This is to try and help you understand the second part of the five skandhas that are empty. And this is a real stretch for a lot of us. It's not easy because we go along and we believe that we have a body and a mind. This is the nature of who we are in this very diluted form. And we say that my body is something that belongs to me. My body belongs to me. And therefore, and I want you to follow this if you can. The me, my body belongs to me. So the me, if my body belongs to me, then the me must be my mind. So, is the mind the owner of the body? But when I say my mind, I have a mind. Here, the mind is the object of the mind. Oh. <coughs> so the mind belongs to whom? Does the body belong? Who does the body belong to? I think we've got some problems here, don't we? We've got a real paradox going on. But it's okay. The Buddha says it's all right. He saw beyond this. No wonder we saw. We can't even figure this out. Body, mind, who belongs to who? 
So the Buddha taught us the truth of interbeing, and we saw that in the 12 links of causation. Again, I bring up my piece, piece of paper. Both the left and right side manifest at the same time. They lean on each other. You can't separate them. Aha. In other words, if our bo body ceases to exist, does our mind cease to exist? an interesting concept, isn't it? And modern medicine today says, hey, you know, the body's sick. I want to heal the patient. They have to heal both together, the body and the mind. If you've got a good doctor, <laughs> if you can find one. But looking deeply, all joking aside, looking deeply into the five aggregates, looking deeply into all these, is there anything permanent there? Anything? Anything will last? You don't see a self commanding the five aggregates around. Get up there and do some work. You don't. Now, there's wrong views out there. And up here, no, no. That's okay. Right view. It's, I'll, use, I'll use the word. Right view. Right view is part of the Noble Eightfold Path. It's around well. Right view. But these, there's some wrong views. And the Buddha talked about these. Yeah, I better get the blue one. <coughs> That's some more circles to draw. So one view. One, one of the views that is wrong. is that this is the self, and it's equal to the five skandhas. <clears throat> but we've just said that there's nothing permanent in the five skandhas. So they're ever-changing. So the self is always changing. There's nothing permanent there. So if the, the skandhas disappear, where does our self go? The next one, this is, this, this is a good one. <laughs> we got the five skandhas here. It's not equal to self. That's another view. It's outside of the self. Well, where's that? Think about that one. Have I completely confused everybody? So how can that be? And then there's the, there's the other one, another wrong view. Where the self is equal, or the self is is not equal to the five skandhas, but is equal. Think about that one. We go along thinking. Here's an example. Think about what you were like at three. Now look at yourself. Are you that same person? You might be somewhat equal, but you're, you're not equal. <laughs> I had more hair. <laughs> so that is a reference point to help you try to understand that. Now the last one, the fourth wrong view. the self is in the five skandhas. Or the five skandhas are in the self. Now why have I done this exercise? 
not to run out of market, but just to get you to think that we really cling to this idea of a zone. We're programmed that way. But if you turn to your second page of the handout, it's about myself. That is what this whole thing on the five skin is. And why I brought you into the four foundations of mindfulness is to be mindfully aware, first of all. And that's why the Buddha taught us Nian Padi Sadi Sutra. Because of the relationship to understanding those four objects of mindfulness and how it helps us to get in touch and debunk the idea of a self. Do you have any questions, or have I totally confused you? <laughs> <laughs> no sense, right? Okay, now we're going to go a little further. Venerable Maggie kind of raised her eyebrows at it. We're going into the forbidden zone, are we? <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> oh, dear. But, but most of you students have been here but for a couple of years. So I really want to stretch. I just didn't want to give you the five. Maybe that's my ego, eh? Yeah. Okay. The second, the second part of the handout talks about that the um, the five skandhas is an analysis of the personal experiences, which I've been saying all the way through, of view to cognition. From a Buddhist perspective, it also provides a logical and thorough approach to understand the universal truth of no self. No self is one of the three Dharma seals. The first one is impermanence. We've talked about that. We talk about it all the time. The Heart Sutra, and any anybody who doesn't have a copy, just let Venerable Man you know I have a copy of the Heart Sutra. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So is perception, volition, consciousness. They're all empty. They all are without a self. So if we touch deeply the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality, we can really see through all the four wrong views that I showed you about self. That there is no separate self out there. Please rise. That there's no separate self. We can see that the self is empty. When we start looking back to the diagram I have of the five standards, there was nothing permanent, nothing that will stay. Nothing lasting forever. If you look even deeper, and when I, I, I spoke earlier about understanding conditionality in my life, coming from a period of meditation, and I sat there for about an hour after I came from this session, and looking deeply, I saw all my ancestors. I saw, first of all, my mother and my father in me. And then I had this vision of my grandparents, and back, and back, and back. If you really get deep to understand this, or just look at yourself, you'll see every one of your ancestors in every cell of <coughs> your body. Science has proven this. We all go back to our mother. Finally caught up to what the Buddha taught us. Everything is in us. So what does that do for us? Touching really deeply, it frees us. It frees us from all these afflictions, all this fear, all this, everything is in us. And going a little bit further, there's no separate self, there's no separate identity, there's no separate body. We're all one. Four great elements that are in this universe are in us. <coughs> We're all one affecting each other, conditioning each other, and getting the results of that. It's kind of scary when you think about it. 
And that's why I sat on my meditation cushion that day and had to think about this for a long time. <laughs> so with the ultimate truth, and that's what your handout goes on to say, no birth, no death, no being, no non-being. But we have a problem. Okay. This X is birth. This X is death. So here we exist. So before, before birth, there was nothing. Is that what the Buddha taught? And after death, there's nothing. There's non being. Is that what the Buddha taught? Out of nothing, you become something or someone. But no one thing comes from nothing, is what the Buddha taught. They come from conditions. So I'm going to, I forgot about that. I am going to do a Jesse magic trick. <laughs> Got to bring the whole group in. So. so the Buddha taught us this, and he's talked about this many times over. I'm sure Grace knows exactly what I'm doing. Got the flame of my lighter, and I'm burning my non And I've lit the candle. Is that flame different? Or is it the same flame? The flame that went from the lighter to the candle. Uh huh. Anybody else? Being and non-being, birth and death. What moves on? The three-year-old to the 62-year-old woman here. And then there's going to be rebirth. A meaning of that. So the handout, I've given you some questions. The people that have a handout, can, can you just stand up and people can form groups with those? Because I really, there's quite a bit to look at, and I really don't want to take up the next 15 minutes writing them down. But just for the others, I put down, how does the teaching of the five skandhas impact, uh, um, how or does the teaching impact or improve the quality of your life in practice? The next one is, what is emptiness? And how does the teaching of the five skandhas help us to understand this? The third question is, is there one skanda that gives you a greater challenge? And if so, which one? And then I've gone on with the next five points is that addressing the issue that self owns and approximates. Self is permanent, is a permanent fact. And then for discussion, self acts and initiates. Self is a subject that knows and sees. And self distinguishes one person from it. Some things to play with. You can discuss in your group anything that the group feels is important. Have fun.